but thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, present today and uh, talk about uh, a collaborative effort uh, on the part of um, uh, the, uh, the virtual production working group here at uh, ETC uh, with some work done over the summer. This is kind of recapitulating some, some slides I put together for a SIMPTI panel that a number of us were on uh, recently. And it's about um, trying to evaluate virtual production stages and the extent to which they uh, quote unquote, get the lighting right and, and what that might mean uh, for that. And the observation really is that the LED panels in a virtual production stage th serve three purposes. Like we all know about the in-camera backgrounds um, and that part of it can be traced back to, you know, rear projection stuff from the 1930s. But there's been a new thing, um, which is that now that there's enough uh, dynamic range and illumination levels um, and kind of the desire to try to do the real world equivalent of image based lighting, uh, these LED panels are now in something that's not uh, as much from the 1930s are getting used as light sources as trying to provide the illumination on actors so that they look like they're lit by the light of the environments that they're that they're standing in front of. And then finally, this very nice uh, property of display as well, which is to show actors uh, and directors and cinematographers kind of a, a sense of um, while they're on set, what the composites are going to look like and what the environment is going to be. And that has lots of nice effects uh, as well. Um, so looking specifically at the first topic here on lighting, um, the first time that uh, I was part of a project uh, to try to surround actors with LEDs, uh, specifically to light them with the light of virtual sets, was the, the Light Stage 3 project at SIGGRAPH 2002. Um, and Matt was able to composite actors into HDRI maps and, um, and virtual sets rendered in, in Arnold. There was a real-time component of having the actors on a turntable, and as you rotated the turntable, it would actually live rotate the lighting around too, so it looks like the camera. Uh, is going around. But at the time, there weren't dense enough LED panels to do in-camera backgrounds. And um, for that, we actually did an infrared compositing system in the background. So there's a black cloth that reflects infrared light, there's a beam splitter camera with IR, and we did the composites using uh, using infrared, which is an improvement over green screen, because you don't have to do um, uh, keying uh, for that. But um, this project led to our involvement in the movie uh, Gravity, um, which at that point, LED panels were available and the uh, system um, that got used for that was the light box. And that surrounded actors with about a 10 foot cube of LED panels, not specifically for backgrounds, but specifically for lighting and playing back the um, um, environments rendered in Arnold uh, on the actors so that their faces would composite into the virtual spacesuits and virtual scenes and have the the right lighting and viewpoint, and they did some amazing visual effects at Framestore for that. And that inspired other places like Industrial Light and Magic to get into doing this as well. Uh, in um, Rogue One, ILM, Disney, and Lex Machina put together a big LED panel stage to light the um, uh, X-Wing uh, cockpits and see reflections and lighting on those. Uh, and John Knoll was excited about using this real-world form of image-based lighting to light actors and sets and found it to be really successful. And we've also seen continued interest in using LED panels for in-camera backgrounds as well. I think one of the things that took a lot of note, uh, people took a lot of note, it was AR Wall's effort where they were tracking the camera and adjusting the perspective in the background, kind of coming at it from an augmented reality uh, standpoint uh, to do that. The first large yeah, the first large scale stage that I'm aware of that did this was actually done in China for a movie called Astura. They started building their stage in 2016. It's about 90 feet wide, a full cube of illumination um, and the most expensive visual effects movie produced in China to date. And then, of course, we've seen lots of streaming shows, including The Mandalorian and others from ILM uh, beginning to use these techniques as well. And my current employer at uh, Netflix, this has been getting used in lots of different productions. This is a particularly large scale virtual production stage done for uh, in Germany for a show called 1899. There's an almost wraparound uh, curved screen here lighting the stern of a ship and then uh, a complete ceiling uh, as well. And um, to move forward a bit, what we've found is that the LED panels um, can be used as lighting sources, uh, but 
it's a little bit of different requirements to be a good in-camera background versus being a good light source. In particular, you really need high resolution and, and a wide color gamut to be a good in-camera background. But to do real-world image-based lighting on actors, it's, it's far more important to be high dynamic range and have good broad spectrum of illumination. And if we evaluate these um, uh, systems, we'll see that we might not have met all of the needs of both of these with the current uh, design. So what I'd like to talk about uh, now is kind of the, the results of the uh, lighting reproduction test that we did with USDETC. We know all about them and amazing projects that they've done. But the design of this um, test was to take a couple of real people and some lighting reference objects out to a few real world locations, photograph what these people look like in these real locations, record the lighting with high dynamic range imaging, and then see how well out of the box a virtual production stage can reproduce that lighting. If you have the actors stand in the virtual production stage lit by the illumination that you recorded, or at least displaying the, uh, the HDRI maps on the panels, does it light the actors to look the same as they did in the real world? And we were lucky that Riot opened up their uh, internal kind of uh, library room here for our two interiors and let us go outside and shoot next to the building for the two exteriors that we got. Um, these are our two actors that we have here. And um, this is the uh, one of the two interiors that we work with. The light mostly comes from the front from these windows. You can see that reflected in the mirrored sphere here. Um, every time that the actors stepped out, we got a background plate and then uh, I stepped in and got an HDRI map which is um, seven exposures, two stops apart, looking in three directions on a fisheye lens. And then uh, Eric Winquist, uh, part of our group from Weta, professionally assembled these into amazing HDRI maps. And um, those uh, become uh, consistent and we have the full dynamic range of these things um, uh, as well. You can even uh, see the reflections of the illumination uh, there and it can accurately light um, you know, either a mirror ball or a diffuse ball, it shows that you've got all the lighting there. We did another one of these uh, from side lighting. Um, and um, as we shot all of these, uh, Tim Kang, who I think is on the call today, actually shot spectral measurements and uh, key to fill ratios with his equipment as well. So this is pretty well documented for the project. We went outside and shot uh, a nice shady environment. Uh, that was pretty straightforward to do. And then we went out and um, gotten the sun, that's less straightforward to do if you're shooting HDRI and we'll see on the virtual production stage less uh, easy to um, reproduce because the sun is so darn bright. It's like um, 50,000 times as bright as the sky around it. And so if you want to capture the full dynamic range, which we do, uh, we have to do something about the fact that the sun tends to saturate even in that shortest 8,000th of a second uh, exposure that you do in your HDR series. And so uh, we've done some research over the years about recording the full intensity of the sun. Some of those use 1,000x neutral density filters. And Weta has developed a nice uh, process where on um, the, uh, the Sigma fisheye lens, uh, you can actually screw a 1,000x uh, ND filter into the front and uh, capture another HDR series that actually gets the intensity of the sun. So when we held that over our, our fisheye, there's the sun. And in that HDR series, that last exposure at an 8,000th of a second, it doesn't uh, saturate. So you actually get correct um, proper recording of the sun intensity, and then you can put together an HDRI map that uh, has all the intensity of the sun. So with that recorded, it was time to go to a virtual production stage. We were lucky to be able to use the Line 204 smart stage in Pacoima. And um, thank you to the, the folks who let us, let us on there to go shoot some stuff. And um, we wanted to put these HDRI maps on the stage and have actors lit by them and see how they looked and if they looked the same as they did in the real world. Um, we spent some time, and actually it took all of our first two days that we planned to shoot um, to make sure that they were producing linear values out so that like the EXR files with the lighting, you know, pixel values are proportional to amount of light. That's important. And then when it gets turned back into light, we need to make sure that the panels are displaying uh, amounts of illumination that are proportional to the pixel values that we're sending. So that took some doing to figure out and um, some chasing down of some 
rogue tone mapping functions that were in the pipeline before we got to pretty acceptable linearity. Another thing that was tricky was just to get the geometry to be correct. And we were worried about the fact that it looked like there was kind of a missing segment of environment between the wall and the ceiling when we were displaying things. And again, it took a surprising amount of time and actually making a, a special calibration pattern to put on the stage to debug this and notice, yeah, there is really a problem with the seam here in order to figure out that there was a rogue 150% scaling going on. Um, for the video signal going to the ceiling panels that eventually when we turn that back to 100%, now things matched up pretty nicely. And I felt like, okay, yes, we can proceed with our test. Now, as in many virtual production stages, the ceiling can actually go brighter than the walls. Um, it's done with like coarser, lighter panels that can um, go to, I think in this case, 5,000 or 6,000 nits. The walls could go to maybe 35, uh, 1350 nits. Uh, we would have loved to use all of that um, range to do brighter environments for the ceiling parts. But the only thing that was really easy to do would have been to just have everything arbitrarily that went to the ceiling show up three or four times as bright as what went to the walls. And that doesn't really make any sense because then they wouldn't be, you know, doing the same thing as the walls in terms of the pixel values in the files. So the only easy thing we could do for this test was to run the ceilings dimmer than they could go so that they were at the same 1350 nits as the walls. Um, but in the future, with like the latest versions of Unreal Engine, we could probably take advantage of that and have the, 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 the ceiling could probably display more of the sky uh, without saturating, but you'd still have a, a clean join between that and the walls when we saw uh, things go across the scene now. So with all of that figured out, we could actually start shooting. So we brought our two actors on. Unfortunately, since we spent the first two days uh, calibrating, we had to come back a week later and one of our actors disappeared. So we tried to do our best to kind of match somebody with similar skin tone, but it's suboptimal uh, that we didn't have a one for one comparison. Uh, but um, uh, I think the, the, the test is still somewhat informative. Um, our first lighting environment um, is the interior front. So here's what we actually shot at Riot. And then we put this HDRI map on the stage. We had the actors uh, stand in it. And then we took a decently exposed photo of that, crossed our fingers, it might kind of match, and here's what we got. Ah, oh no, it didn't really match very well at all. Like uh, the ratio of the lighting on the actors to the background was very different. The key to fill ratio on the actors was different. The coloration of the of light on the actors was different. And um, we had to figure out, okay, so why is this happening? So something that we used as a diagnostic tool was to actually bring our HDRI map capture system, which is the Canon 5D Mark IV with the fisheye lens. And we actually re-photographed the lighting in the LED stage as an HDRI map, which um, I think somebody called this round tripping uh, the lighting from the real lighting we have to how it got reproduced on the stage. And um, the first thing we noticed, we kind of rotate this around, we put the what would be like the front of the stage where you walk in, in the middle of the uh, panorama. Well, here's a problem. A lot of the light in this scene is coming from the front of the stage, and that's totally missing uh, in this area. We, we did put the actors deeper into the stage to try to get more of a wraparound from the panels, but we were still missing about 90 degrees of angle. And it turns out if you knock out the front 90 degrees of angle, it changes the lighting on your actors a lot. It changes it a huge amount if that happens to be where most of the light is coming from. But even in a diffuse environment, if you were to put up a, a black cloth and photograph an actor missing those 90 degrees of light, uh, and then compare it to a photo when you're not blocking those 90 degrees of light, you'll see that um, an actor, it doesn't matter if it's lighter skin tone or darker skin tone, will uh, have a very different appearance when they're missing that light to when they have that light. And while the difference isn't quite as much as night and day, it's two very different forms of day that you can see. And that's a little bit of a worry because a lot of virtual production stages don't build out 360 degrees around. The reason for that is sound because you get a lot of sound reflection if you enclose people completely. But it's certainly not helping out the realism of the lighting you're putting on people. So we thought that our best mitigation that we could do is actually try to use the entire virtual production stage for lighting. And to do that, we had everybody turn 180 degrees around so that now the actors were looking into 
the back of the stage where all the LED panels are, and they'd have LEDs to the front and to the left and to the right and above them. And now we don't have an in-camera background, so fortunately we had some green screens around, and so we we did that. So eventually we could composite these shots. If anybody has a strong desire to help composite these shots for us and put these actors on the right on the background plate, uh, that would be helpful. We realized that this instantly made uh, a significant difference in terms of the appearance of the actors and just generally where the lighting is coming from. Uh, so it's a little hard to tell without the, the composite going on, but you can see that these, these look better than what we had before by quite a bit in terms of reproducing the lighting. Um, but it didn't seem like the key to fill ratio was quite right yet. It felt a little bit muted. So in this case, um, you know, kind of looking at this here, you definitely have you know, a, a little bit more directionality to the illumination. And so um, we would keep in mind that maybe we have to look at the dynamic range of the lighting as well. And let's take a look at that through our next interior lighting bar, which is lighting from the side. Um, this worked out a lot better because also there's totally LED panels to the sides of the actors the way that we're lighting it. And if you zoom in on faces, things are pretty good. Something that seemed a little bit off is that like the specular reflection of the LED lights that were practical inside the library is, is, is a significantly easier to see here in the real one. And it's quite a bit muted here in the, uh, in the virtual one. Um, and so we actually looked at um, kind of our round tripping of the illumination. This is what we started with. And then this is re-photographing that from the middle of the um, LED stage. And Amusingly, um, it actually matches up pretty well. It's actually kind of funny to stand in this stage here and see the same people, you know, standing around on the sides in the same positions that we could see over here. So that all kind of matched. Um, but if you were to look to see um, how well it's matching the dynamic range, you'll notice uh, here that, um, you know, there's a sky out here and it actually should be blue. And out here, there should be a blue sky, but it's not looking blue. And if we take the um, data down by um, a few stops, you'll see that the real HDRI map actually encoded that there's a blue sky out there. It's just too bright to show if you showed it at zero stops in, a, in the zero to one range. But in the LED stage, uh, those were getting clipped. And so you don't really have the true intensity of the light coming from there or the color of the light coming from there. And so what we thought we could do is do something that, again, if we, we focus less on trying to get a great in-camera background, we could intentionally show a stops down version of the HDRI map so we don't have that clipping in the LED stage. And so by bringing that down by four stops, now the sky doesn't saturate, the interior LED strip here on the ceiling doesn't saturate, and the rest of the scene gets a little bit muddy and it's probably down into that kind of like dithering region that the panels are having to struggle with very low pixel values but they are representing the lighting kind of radiometrically accurately at this point and if you photograph the actors you have to stop up the camera to do this then the matches started to get really much more satisfying and now you can see you actually got like kind of the right key to fill ratio here you see the reflections of the other lighting in the environment. Um, the mirrored sphere and the diffuse sphere match quite well. And the only thing that really seems to be off is like the colors in Eric's shirt here. Um, we'd asked uh, Eric if he could wear something colorful. And uh, he picked a uh, shirt from a, from a Jams World here that has lots of nice colors. You notice there's quite a bit of color shift. Actually, not just in the shirt, but in the skin tones as well. Eric kind of shifts toward pink uh, and our other actors shift toward uh, reddish with the darker skin tones. And we're gonna see that in the next couple of examples too. But then kind of finishing up with our exteriors, um, outside um, the environment that really worked the best was the exterior shade environment. We didn't really have a big dynamic range problem with it. When we put it on the panels, it kind of felt like we were outside again, even though we were stuck on the stage all day. and. Uh, Everyone kind of enjoyed that. So it seems like cloudy days or shady days are good for virtual production for the lighting. And um, the result matched pretty good right out of the box, actually, because there wasn't much clipping of the environment um, with the dynamic range that was available. 
Um, if we looked pretty closely, Keita Phils looked pretty good. Um, the only problem that we had is this kind of like reddish pink shift on the skin tones, which is suboptimal. And of course, the shirt also still looks quite a bit different um, from the natural illumination to the LED stage. Um, doing this at fewer stops, you know, uh, also worked, didn't, didn't make a huge difference. Exterior sun, this we knew was going to be challenging because there's such a wide dynamic range of the light. Uh, this is what we got out of the box with the LED stage. Kind of, sort of works a bit, uh, but you'll notice these people actually look like they're standing in the sun. These folks here look more like they're standing in the shade because they just don't have very sharp shadows or, or shine on their skin with the highlights. We tried doing the trick where we bring everything down uh, four stops. Um, helped a tiny bit, but not really a lot. Um, because the problem is like just the sun is, is so freakishly bright. You need basically another 10 stops of illumination to get to the sun and represent what was coming through our filters. Um, and so, um, uh, what we, uh, decided to do was to try to, uh, bring in a special light source for the sun and, Tim Kang had a, a nice one by one in a tall light stand. And very fortunately, he had measured the key to fill ratio when we we're actually shooting. And um, we set that light up in the virtual production stage so that it was directly in the line from where the sun was being displayed on the panels uh, to where the subjects were. So it's basically coming from about the right angle. And then Tim set the key to fill ratio to be about the same. Uh, not sure how many people in the world would be able to do that that quickly, but Tim got it, and, and um, uh, we're very fortunate to have some someone with that skill set there. Here's the it's kind of like a little eclipse going on here with that sun in front of the other sun. Of course, this goes a lot brighter. We're not really matching the diameter of the sun accurately because the real sun is like half a degree disc. This is you know a square foot up there, but in terms of the lighting wasn't a big problem. We proposed adding special lights for the sun in virtual production stages for a while. And um, here's what we got with um, the uh, combined light from the uh, special sunlight and the virtual production stage. Here, here's the real result. It was a quite satisfying match. Uh, everything seemed to match pretty well. The mirror ball looked right. The diffuse ball looked right. And we had shadows on the faces. Maybe the lighting direction was a little off on here because there's, you know, kind of a local light source there. And then also very importantly, magically, the shirt now kind of looked the same too between the two. And those of us who've been following, you know, or uh, any of what's going on with Spectrum, you know, the reason for this is that that light source that we added for the sun is actually a broad spectrum light, not a spectrally deficient light source like an LED panel. Uh, is. So those were kind of the results where for each one of our environments, we found that out of the box, there's some challenges to making it look right, but then there are some mitigation factors that we can do to try to get decent uh, results. So there's some ongoing work to try to look at the Sony Venice camera footage that we have. We'd like to actually do the composites. I quickly was coding up an HDR shop in the background, an auto spread HDRI filter that would um, kind of like dilate out the light from the light sources in a radiometrically accurate way uh, that also preserves chroma so that you know if you're not in camera then you can represent a slightly larger version of a light source kind of automatically and then get higher dynamic range without having to stop down um, and um, you know kind of the biggest takeaway is that you know this spectrum that led lighting has where uh, the red green and blue leds of either you know traditional light sources when we were doing this 20 years ago to the LED panel lights, when they only have, you know, red, green, and blue, relatively peaky spectra, there's a big section of spectrum missing that um, is important for lighting uh, faces. And uh, it's become even more clear that when these LEDs are chosen to increase color gamut, which tends to push the red LEDs deeper into the longer wavelengths and pull the green LEDs uh, shorter into the short wavelengths. It increases the gap, increases the color gamut, but wider color gamut on panels actually makes them a worse light state, makes them a better display, but a worse light source. 
And in particular, what happens is when you push that uh, red LED uh, further into the into the long wavelengths, it gets to a part of the skin reflectance spectrum that has more and more red in it. And so lighting somebody with RGB LEDs versus white LEDs is just going to make them look more red uh, than they should. And that's even if you color balanced your white card accurately. That's really why it's a why it's a problem for that. So same thing happened on that orange shirt as well. Basically, it continues to reflect more and more light as you go into the deeper red with that super long wavelength red in the LED panels. You just pick up more red than you should if it were a more normal part of the spectrum uh, there. So that's something you know we've looked at in our research for a while is adding more LED colors to improve color rendition. Ambers, cyans, broad spectrum white, broad spectrum amber and yellow. Uh, we've got that in the research. We've built whole light stages, multispectral lights, ways of capturing multispectral illumination and reproducing it so that you get pretty accurate lighting values, and even building larger virtual production stages that allow you to get good color rendition with pretty high dynamic range coming from every direction. And so this might be a uh, thing to look at for future. Um, virtual production systems that can try to use uh, a, a greater degree of lighting that has multi-spectral illumination in it. And maybe we'll even convince the LED panel manufacturers to consider adding a broad spectrum white or a yellow into the package of the LEDs that form the LED panels. And we'll have those in professional LED panels, not just in like this little hobbyist solution LED panel that you can get from uh, Adafruit. So that's kind of our project, kind of rushed through that a little bit. Uh, we're hoping to uh, get a paper and the data on etcenter.org in the coming months and looking for people to uh, help with that. And I think there's maybe a minute or two for a question if you guys are interested. Yeah, so thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate it. Great talk, such fantastic data uh, and pulling it all together. Do we have any questions right off hand? I see one hand raised. Who is that? It's not telling me who it is. <laughs> Um, Kevin Wheatley, did you have a question? No, I was just clapping. I was oh, just clapping. clapping. Sorry, <laughs> thought there was a hand. <laughs> um, Jim Ryder. Uh, hello, yeah, thanks for the information. Uh, it sounds like we've got some time to wait before manufacturers might uh, have more broad spectrum LEDs, so I'll keep my eye on that. But I'm just in terms of the dynamic range. And the issues you were seeing where if you rephotographed your HDRI on the LED stage, you just don't have the, the range. Uh, is there, do you have any experience with, uh, I'm hearing a lot more about HDR LED panels and like the uh, Brompton Hydra calibrated, which uh, panels which uh, will increase the uh, dynamic range apparently and whether you have any information or thoughts on that technology. Uh, yeah, I think that's helpful. From from what I can tell, the interest has, of adding these HDR features to the panels has been trying to get like the low end to look better. Like it's actually not making you know a huge difference in terms of how bright they go. That's just still limited by the absolute brightness of the LEDs. But if we're going to play this trick where we intentionally underexpose the scene onto the panels so that we have headroom for the lighting then it does become super helpful if they're able to do good renditions of, of darker areas um, in, in those with, you know, either their, their spatial or temporal dithering. And, and we can take advantage of that. And that, that, that would help. I don't know if other people uh, want to want to say something about that too, but I think it's, we do it, have it a Lude on the call. If he had any feedback there. Well, no, I think you covered it pretty well there. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> The, the, Thank excuse you. me. The, the other issue, oh, uh, it's Tim talking yeah. here. Um, the other issue as well is you you can increase and change dynamic range, um, but you cannot change the beam size naturally. So there are many instances of lighting where still you're going to hit that limitation with LED walls. Um, if you're, let's say, if you wanted like a spotlight feel, you know, um, there's a lot of lighting, lighting scenarios where you still need to augment somehow with practical lighting fixtures. So 
but um, the but what Paul was saying was absolutely correct. Where you need, if you want to recreate, especially a hard lighting sort of source, you have to be able to uh, increase the dynamic range to a lower end, so that you have the proper amount of detail in your highlights and and low low lights in in the lighting map. So yeah, that's definitely uh, pretty pretty important. And I got to say, I, I love the colorful shirt you've got going on there, Paul. I feel like <laughs> it was well, so inspired by is, Eric. <laughs> I want to thank Eric Rigney because he personally dropped off his shirt for uh, <laughs> us to take spectral measurements. And I had it for a week and I kind of didn't want to give it back. But, you know, <laughs> he picked it up. But I looked at the tag. It came from jamsworld.com. He apparently bought his on the Venice Beach Boardwalk in the 90s. So they don't sell that shirt anymore. But I did find two <laughs> shirts that do have every color of the rainbow. This is the one of them that I'm willing to wear in public. There's another one that's even more extreme, which is so good for testing virtual production stages because it really is just solid blossoms of flower rainbows from red to orange to yellow to green to blue, uh, even a little fuchsia. Um, and it looks very, very different in a virtual production stage than in any other lighting environment. And uh, I'll, I'll be showing up to LED stage demos in, in, in one of the shirts in, in the future. But jamsworld.com if you want to have your own. Well, excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for your time, Paul. And uh, really appreciate everything. Great work bringing everything together.